In the old days of 2016 and 2017, before there were transformers, there were recurrent neural networks and LSTMs. They were all the rage. Maybe we need them back again to show us the way to AGI and maybe Tesla is going to lead the way. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. As I was doing my master's research primarily in 2017 and 2018, and I was doing it on visual systems, so I wasn't really paying attention to transformers because at the time they were just coming about for natural language processing. But anyway, the things that everybody was using at that point were RNNs, or recurrent neural networks, and LSTMs, or long short-term memory networks. And these had a lot of really, really huge advantages and actually touch on a model of consciousness that requires looping or feedback feedback in terms of our own human brains. But recurrent style neural networks had two huge Achilles heels, and when transformers came about, especially visual transformers and language transformers, they basically took over the world because they didn't have either of those advantages. But again, according to this model of mind that requires for consciousness that there is a looping sort of feedback system, transformer models don't have that. They're kind of dumb and they're only feed forward. So there is a possibility and perhaps a necessity that we need to add recurrency back into our networks in order to get to sort of an AGI situation where these large language models and other types of models become semi-conscious. First, let's read a couple of quick definitions from Wikipedia, which is very, very useful for quick definitions, about RNNs and LSTMs. A recurrent neural network, or RNN, is a class of artificial neural networks where connections between nodes can create a cycle, allowing output from some nodes to affect subsequent input into the same nodes. This allows it to exhibit temporal dynamic behavior, derived from feedforward neural networks, RNNs can use their internal state or memory to process variable length sequences of inputs. This makes them applicable to tasks such as unsegmented, connected handwriting recognition, or speech recognition. Recurrent neural networks are theoretically Turing complete and can run arbitrary programs to process arbitrary sequences of inputs. And then to LSTMs, which are actually sort of a subcategory of RNNs, long short-term memory is an artificial neural network used in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. Unlike standard feed-forward neural networks, LSTM has feedback connections, again, just like an RNN. Such a recurrent neural network can process not only single data points, such as images, but also entire sequences of data, such as speech or video. This characteristic makes LSTM networks ideal for processing and predicting data. For example, LSTM is applicable to tasks such as unsafe segmented connected handwriting recognition, speech recognition, machine translation, speech activity detection, robot control, video games, and healthcare. So RNNs and LSTM sound great, right? That sounds like they should solve all of the problems. So what were the big issues? There were two huge issues. One was the vanishing slash exploding gradient problem. And the other one is serialization. So let's start with that second one, serialization, because that's easier to understand for a lay person. Basically, in order to do recurrent neural networks or LSTMs, I'm just going to call them RNNs because they're both recurrent neural networks. So, you know, one's just a specific type of that. But basically what you have to do is move forward and then loop back again and pick up what you were working on and move forward again. So it's a form of memory, which is super, super important. But the problem is that it serializes everything. You can only move through your data and your training one bit at a time, loop, 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 and then you get the next thing and you loop, 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 loop. And that is a serial way of doing things, right? It's like a long, thin train. What you really want for training efficiency is parallelization. So instead of a train that's all these cars linked together in a serial form, you want all of the train cars driving simultaneously simultaneously. Or you could think instead of a traffic jam on a long and windy road where it's just one car after another and it's just do, 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 they're going through, you want one of those like, you know, 500 lane freeways where everybody's just blasting along because you can get all 500 cars going at the same speed. So what you want in order to train efficiency is all these cars driving at the same speed at the same time, not one after another where they get bottlenecked and everything goes slowly. You can process a lot more data in training if you can do it in parallel, especially because graphics cards and neural processing unit cards and TPUs and whatever else, these things are all designed for massive parallelization. So they work really, really well if you can throw a whole bunch of stuff at once at them. And the way that transformers work is they're rather flat. That was the major sort of 
you know, thing that changed about them. They also use QKV and all of that kind of stuff. And you can check out videos on that if you're interested. But one of the major, major things about transformers that makes them so amazing is that they're flat. They basically unroll that that long, windy highway where all the cars are stuck behind each other. They just go whoop like that. And they kind of like turn it on its side, which I believe is why they're called transformers. I think they're transforming something that's more serial, temporally based into something that's more spatially based. But the effect of that is that you can train things in parallel, which means that you have massive training efficiencies when you use transformers. The other critical problem with recurrent neural networks is that they have vanishing or exploding gradients. So what you're doing when you do this stuff, when you loop back and you capture something and you move it forward in the state, effectively what's happening is, you know, we're calling this memory, but it's multiplication. So you're multiplying things back into it as a waiting system. And that waiting system affects where you are currently, right? So you're at this particular state, but what you're doing is you're looping back and you're looking at this state back here, or maybe two states back, or maybe five states back, or whatever. And you're multiplying all of those weights through to get to your current state. And therefore this adjusts the weights on your current neural network's state and allows it to take account of memory. The problem with multiplication, if you've ever done this, and I'm a geek because I used to do this, as soon as I got a calculator when I was a kid, you just keep multiplying small numbers like, you know, 0.98 or something. It's, it's, a, it's a relatively large number close to one. But if you multiply it, multiply it, multiply it, multiply it, multiply it, after seven or eight or 10 steps, it goes down to this tiny, tiny little number because it just basically disappears. The other option is if you start multiplying numbers together that are like 1.5 or something, not a very big number, but you multiply that together enough times and you get to infinity essentially. And the problem with that is either something really big close to infinity or something that's essentially zero. Take zero for instance, that's really easy, right? It doesn't matter what your number is, what your weight is. If you get it multiplied by zero effectively, that means that that particular weight turns off. It's unable to do anything in the current state of the RNN. In opposite fashion, if you get something that's effectively infinite, none of the other weights matter at all, right? So you've got all of these weights that are all beautiful and they're all perfectly modified, and then you get something that's 300 billion. Well, that's obviously going to have the largest effect on that particular state of that particular neuron at that point. So these are huge problems, and it took a lot of work to kind of tweak around that and to figure out how to do things like renormalization and all of that kind Kind of stuff. And, and that's very inefficient. It takes a lot of time. And if you combine that with serialization, the problem with RNNs was that they took forever to train and they still didn't work ideally. So along came transformers and they transformed all of this into parallel types of calculations where you only have to do the multiplication sequence once through. So you don't have these vanishing slash exploding gradient problems and it's all parallelized. So this seems amazing. The problem with transformers is that they are kind of dumb. They're just feed forward networks. You start with something, you end with something, you figure it out, you make a prediction, you know, whatever the next word is or the image or something like that. And then after you do a bunch of sequences of that, you then go back and you look at your objective function or your loss function, you figure out what went wrong and you go back and train it. So it works really effectively. Obviously, it works way better than RNNs did because, you know, the proof is in the pudding. We have things like diffusion models. We have things like large language models like chat GPT, etc. Those things obviously work really, really well. But the argument is that they're not really conscious. They don't really understand what they're doing. They're just sort of fancy, in the case of LLMs, they're fancy word prediction methodologies. And so they'll figure out the next word. And a lot of people are saying, look, they have the prototypical planning type of activity going on. And if you haven't seen that video, I talk about that with Tesla and, and how these LLMs may really, really help Tesla to do longer term planning. Uh, with the cars, but also in particular with the Tesla bot. And Randy Kirk and Scott Walter and I talked about this in a video that probably is coming out today as well. So go check out Randy's channel as well. So again, you might say, well, that's great. Transformers are working fantastically. They work really well and everything is hunky-dory. But the problem, like I said, is that they're rather dumb. They're not that smart. They're just feed-forward systems. And it's amazing that they work as well as they do. And part of the reason why is because they're trained on trillions of words slash billions of images, all of that kind of stuff. So you've got amazing stuff that's out there, but the problem is it doesn't have recurrency. So what I'm saying here, and this is kind of a little bit of a hypothetical thing, but it might be something that Tesla might be working on right now, is a recombination of recurrent neural networks. So maybe we could call them RTNs or recurrent transformer networks. And so my idea is to use these pre-trained transformer networks. You utilize the amazing work that's gone into this and the understanding that they have, and you layer on top of that a sort of recurrent 
current memory or something. So that what you're getting is these transformers, but then you're looping it back into a memory state. Now, is this going to be easy to do? No, because you're gonna get back to the exploding slash vanishing gradient problem and back to the serial problem. And the serialization problem is going to be a big issue when you have these massive transformer networks. They're really, really big. And so adding an RNN on top of that means that you could sort of do a quasi parallel thing. You can train the transformers up in a parallel fashion, but then you have to go back and you have to serially train the recurrent aspects of that. But the upshot of this is if the theory of mind is correct, that it takes feedback loops to create consciousness, the thing that goes on in our brains, then what you're doing is you're taking a rather dumb feed forward network and you're adding that recurrency to it so that it has these loops to it. And also you don't have to get quite as crazy with the RNNs. You know, again, this is all speculative. I haven't built these things by any means, but in speculative terms, you might only need to go back two or three or four states of this recurrency rather than the dozens of states that you might have had to go back to with RNNs or LSTMs. So the, the vanishing gradient problem gets much reduced when you only have to multiply a few times. The big problem arose when you had to multiply 50 or 100 times, then those numbers would start to shrink or expand really rapidly. So this is a really interesting idea, at least in my mind. And the reason why I think Tesla might be the leader of this is because of the nature of driving. Driving is a serial activity. In other words, you do one thing and then you move forward and you do another thing and you do another thing and you do another thing and there's feedback at all of those states. And what do I mean by feedback? What I mean is you turn the wheel a little bit, right? You make a decision in the car, the FSD makes the decision or the human being does, whichever one, it doesn't really matter. You make a decision, you turn the wheel a little bit and then immediately there's a bunch of stuff. The sensors say things, the cameras, your eyes, your brain, your inner ear with balance, all of those things give you feedback, whether you're a human or a machine, and then you roll that feedback back into the next decision you make. So, you know, Tesla's by the nature of driving have to have recurrency. They also have to have a memory. They have to know if you're sitting at a light for a period of time. And, you know, at AI Day 1 in particular, they talked a lot about this, that they have both spatial and temporal recurrency. So what they're able to do is sit at a light and look at the light and remember that that light is red and remember that they need to actually make a turn or go straight or something like that when the light turns green again. Because if you don't have memory, you're sitting there, you're like the ultimate ADD thing and you just get lost and you're like, what am I doing here anymore? Should I go? What, you know, what, what's happening? I have no idea. So you need that type of recurrency in order to have memory in order to drive. So we know from AI Day 2 and John Emmons talk, and you can check that out up here if you're interested, but we know from that that they are using large language model type ideas, that sort of grammar to create a sort of grammar of lanes and the complexity of lanes and how they flow in and out at an intersection. And there's no reason why they couldn't in the meantime, or maybe they just were at the time and they didn't tell us, but they could be using LLMs in more things than they talked about. Certainly they are using transformers a great deal in their vision systems in order to make sense of the world and to do semantic segmentation and all of that kind of stuff as well. And you can check out that video if you're interested as well. This is a rabbit hole you can go down. But anyway, they're using all of this stuff to make sense of the world, but they have to have a memory, which means there has to be recurrency in the full self-driving stack. It's necessary in order to drive. You can't drive as a human being without memory of what it is that you're doing, without feedback from whatever the previous state was to the current state. So, you know, as opposed to something like a large language model, where you could say it doesn't really have to have like an idea of what it did, it just has to know what it's doing going forward. And it can be kind of dumb and it could still operate in a very impressive manner. When you add recurrency into it, you're able to do things like drive. So you've got Tesla at the forefront of transformers for sure. They're using visual transformers all the time, but they're also using language transformers in large language models, specifically we know in intersection situations. And that means that we already know from evidence from both of their AI day talks that they are already working on both of these things. But what if they sort of stack them? What if they take the transformer and they stack the recurrency on top of that? That gets really interesting and could lead to much more impressive driving capabilities, but the really interesting aspect of this is when you plug it into a car and then especially into something like Tesla bot in the future, that can lead to consciousness. That could potentially lead to consciousness. I'm not saying it will, but it is the kind of activity that does meet a specific model of mind that requires feedback loops in order to have consciousness. Ultimately, humans are just really, really sophisticated pattern matching machines with feedback loops inside of ourselves. We pattern match all the time. We recognize 
recognize what things are and we react to that and we get feedback loops. And the feedback loops are, did that work properly? Was it the thing that I expected it to be or was it not? And as a baby, you watch them learn this kind of stuff where they make mistakes and they figure it out. So that's the kind of thing that we do all the time. We pattern match, we feedback loop, we pattern match, we feedback loop. And we get better and better and better at it. And one argument is that our consciousness itself arises from that activity. And of course, language itself and communication is a massive pattern matching activity. You generate patterns that other people either read or hear, and they interpret those patterns and, you know, turn them into something, which requires models of mind and all sorts of other things to go on in ourselves. And we're seeing some prototypical behavior of that coming about through large language model transformers. But if we take something like what Tesla is already working on and really start to meld RNNs on top of transformers and get RTNs, we could be looking at a major step change in the ability of these machines to become conscious and really start to have their own model of mind and have a model of mind of other people, the things that they're talking to or driving around, and then they can actually start to really think. And with that, I will leave you with one final thought, and that is, is this a good thing or not? <laughs> I don't have an answer to to that. It's very exciting to think about what could happen and I would love to have a car that's incredibly intelligent and can drive around and is really sophisticated in its understanding of the world and can drive without me worrying about it and then eventually have a robot in the house that's a very sophisticated robot and really understands my intentionality even if I'm not very good at communicating it and is able to do things for me and work in the world. But at the same time, we're looking at approaching the AI singularity much more rapidly if we do these two things on top of each other, at least according to my prediction, this is all highly speculative. But if this does actually create a step change in the sort of consciousness of these AI models, that creates a situation where these things could become significantly smarter and more importantly, more aware of themselves as entities. And that could lead to a dangerous situation. So I don't have an answer to this, but I think it's a really, really cool and interesting problem. Please do let me know what you think about all of this in the comments. And while you're there, please do like the video so YouTube's AI algorithm will show it to more people people and also consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my Patreon and my YouTube channel members. Thank you all so much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. And if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have Teslabot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.